I'd like to thank you all for joining us here in our service for August 30th, 2020, Oak Grove Christian Church. Uh, if there's any important announcements, you'll see them on the screen above me. Uh, but I'd like to start our service off with a reading from Psalm 101. I will sing of your love and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate, they will not cling to me. Men of perverse heart shall, not, shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him will I not endure. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Will you bow with me? Lord, I thank you that we can worship you today. I pray that you would help us to learn from you, help us to apply your word, and help us to put you first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the important parts of our lesson for today uh, revolves around the Ark of the Covenant and David returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. So I thought it would be appropriate uh, to start us off with a little bit of a video showing what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. Exodus 37, starting in verse 1. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and made a gold molding around it. He cast four gold rings for it and fastened them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with pure gold. He inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. In Hebrews 9, verse 4, this ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Continuing on from Exodus 37, verse 6, he made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking towards the cover. I think one of the coolest things about reading the Bible is learning something new. And so before I get into the actual sermon part uh, for today, I wanted to share with you a few of the new things that I learned this week. Uh, on Wednesday, we talked about uh, the ark being carried on a cart uh, pulled by some donkeys. And uh, Uzzah reached out and took a hold of the ark because the oxen had stumbled and God struck him dead. Now, in the process of that lesson, and I forgot to mention this on Wednesday, I had never thought before about the stuff inside the ark. Because there were things inside it, if it tipped sideways, those things could be ruined. And we saw in the video what those things would have looked like. And we can just imagine those uh, golden or those uh, uh, stone tablets crushing the container of manna or breaking uh, the staff. 
just something that I had never, uh, for some reason, come across before. But something else that I wanted us to look at as we progress through 2 Samuel 6 is in verse 16, and this is after the ark has made it into Jerusalem. Uh, Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And I think we have some idea of what it means to despise somebody for their worship, and I'll get into that more a little bit later. But I want to look at some of the other times where this same Hebrew word was used. Uh, this is the same word that was used in Genesis 25, 34. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and he rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Thus Esau despised his birthright. 1 Samuel 17, 42. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he despised him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And some of your translations will say they're disdained, but it is the same Hebrew word. Uh, David himself will use this word uh, in Second uh, Samuel chapter 12, uh, verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Uh, So that's one case where it's it's used in a description of David. Uh, God uses it in uh, earlier in that story. uh, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? And then uh, it gets even a little bit more intense. Uh, In Psalm 51, David uses the same word. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O Lord, thou will not despise. If that wasn't enough, several of the prophets were despised. But then we get to what I think might be the most interesting of these passages. Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So whatever Michael was doing, this look that she gave, is the same look that Esau would have given his birthright, the same look that Goliath gave David, the same kind of uh, disrespect that David showed Uriah the Hittite, the same kind of treatment that uh, the Israelites or the Hebrews were giving to the prophets. And we know from the Gospels, uh, the parable there, how badly the prophets were treated. And then if that wasn't enough, the same word that she uh, that's used to describe her, the same look that she's giving David is the same kind of look, the same kind of response that the people gave to Jesus in their rejection of him. There's a lot of different things that we could look at here in 2 Samuel 6. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of the history things. Um, There's a lot of difficult names. There's a lot of concepts that uh, will be difficult to convey in the time that we have. Uh, But there are plenty of YouTube videos and there's plenty of commentaries that will explain those passages. Uh, But the first place that I wanted to focus was uh, the verse that we looked at just a little bit ago. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, uh, the end of verse 16 And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Now we have some idea of what it means to despise somebody in your heart. But I want to talk a little bit more personally and 
explain that in a lot of the churches that I've preached at, I've seen this happen. And I've seen this happen uh, a lot, especially in places where the minister has to sit up on the stage and look out at everyone for the entire service. You can see the look on people's faces. You can see how they react when someone else is worshiping in a different way. Uh, If someone chooses to kneel or someone chooses to raise their hands or someone chooses to say amen or hallelujah or anything along those lines, uh, whoever is singing, whoever is preaching, whoever is playing the piano sees those things. But more importantly, God sees those things. God sees not just the look that we have on our face, this disdain that other people could notice, but God sees all the way to the heart. Uh, There was a discussion at uh, one of the churches I was at uh, because there were a few people who liked to stand throughout the worship service. And other people said uh, they didn't like that because then they couldn't see quite as well. They couldn't see one of the screens or they couldn't see whoever was singing or maybe they couldn't see the piano, uh, depending on what what the angle might be. Uh, But if we are worshiping, it doesn't matter what we can see. I don't think it matters where we are. I don't think it matters whether the person in front of us is singing uh, or not. It doesn't matter if they're standing or raising hands or sitting or kneeling because our audience is vertically. Uh, Our audience is above us. Our audience is God. We are not the audience for somebody else. What we do is for God's glory, for God's benefit, no one else. So they had this discussion of what to do, and, you know, nobody wanted to tell uh, someone else not to stand during worship. But the people standing in the back row or sitting in the back row didn't want to give up their seat so people could stand back there. Uh, So it was kind of an impasse. And what what people did uh, is a little bit of what Michael did, this disdain, uh, this sneering, this kind of judgment from one person to another, and then complaining at home uh, instead of talking to people, instead of looking at their own worship life, Uh, any number of other responses, uh, they chose that one. And that's what Michael does here. Uh, Verse 20, she waits for David to come home. And she says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. And it should be noted, he didn't actually do that. He took off an outer garment. Uh, He didn't disrobe in front of anybody. Uh, It would be at least somewhat similar to someone deciding that it was a little bit too hot in the sanctuary and took off their suit jacket in order to worship. Uh, So she's complaining at home. David will reply, and he's going to reply in a way that maybe maybe he shouldn't have, but uh, he gets to the point of uh, saying, I will become even more undignified than this. And that you'll find one of the worship songs that we have today goes by that same title. It's one that uh, we had heard or I had heard in high school and we heard again uh, throughout college days and uh, church camps and things like that. That's the second part that I wanted to look at. Uh, This response that David has I will become even more undignified than this. In other words, he didn't care what other people thought of how he worshipped. He didn't care what they said about him. Uh, He actually uh, somehow knows that they're going to respect him and honor him uh, for that. And I think that's the kind of king that they needed. They needed someone who uh, was caring only what God thought someone who was willing to do whatever God led them to do without regard for um, what the slave girls thought or what his wife thought or what the generals thought or what the people thought. What matters is what God thinks. And that's the kind of leader uh, that 
God intended David to be. We know he's going to mess up later. But this is the kind of leader that God wanted him to be, prioritizing God over everything, prioritizing worship over everything. And we can see even in some of these verses that I skipped, if you wanted to take a look at those, you can see the kind of worship that David's going to be doing. You can see uh, what it is that uh, he does in his intervening time uh, while his wife is at home, I guess, stewing over what she's going to say, this uh, despising in her heart, uh, how that's going to get manifested. David is worshiping. And that should remind us of the prodigal son, the older brother brooding uh, on his own, the younger brother reunited with the father, the younger brother celebrating the return, the older brother missing out because of his own choice. That's exactly what's happening here. Michael doesn't participate in the rest of this because she stays at home. Um, <clears throat> and so David is uh, going about this, this celebration without her. Now David says in verse 21, It was before the Lord who chose me, uh, rather than your father or anyone from his house, when he appointed me ruler over the uh, Lord's people Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. Uh, continuing the theme of him not caring what other people think. Uh, he is here to worship. That's what he is he's doing. He's returning the Ark of the Covenant back to where it should be back to its rightful home, and he will celebrate. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. That's the kind of mindset that we need to have when we worship. I know it's a little bit different uh, worshiping in the privacy of your own home. No one is there to hear whether you're on key or off key. Nobody is there to know whether you want to stand or to sit. But when we come back to meeting together, we need to put all those things out of our minds and just worship God. It doesn't matter whether there's a piano or an organ or a guitar or a cappella. We are there to worship God. It doesn't matter whether we pass trays for communion or offering or have uh, table at the door or any anything like that we are there to worship and no matter how people choose to worship we should be supporting that and not despising it in our hearts that's what uh, that's what she was doing I think mulling it over thinking about it dwelling on it and continuing over and over again as she was preparing what to say. But instead of the love that she should have had in her heart, what she had was despising David. So where does that leave us? Uh, why does this passage matter? Aside from the things we might learn, aside from it being God's inspired word, what can we take from this uh, that will shape our everyday life. And I think it comes down uh, to the kind of mindset that we're going to have when we worship. I think we should not despise anyone in our hearts. What comes out of our hearts should be love. I had mentioned Isaiah 53 and how Jesus was despised and rejected by men when those men, those women, should have loved him, should have received him, should have uh, obeyed him. They were too busy rejecting him. And I hope that that's not what we will do to people. I hope that 
that we have this love for other people no matter what their worship style might be, no matter what they look like when they worship or no matter what they look like uh, in general. We should not despise others. We are supposed to love our God. We're supposed to love others, and we're supposed to share the gospel. And I don't think we can share the gospel if we're too busy despising one another, whether it's our fellow Christians in church, whether it's our strangers that we see around town, whether it's uh, people that we only see on the news. God has not called us to despise. God has called us to love. And I think the first step to changing our minds and changing our heart and uh, adapting our responses is to worship, to worship God freely without caring one bit what other people think. That's what David did. That's the example that we have in Scripture for today. Someone worshiping without any hindrance. And that's how we should worship right now. Today doesn't feel very much like August, but I'm not sure exactly what August is supposed to feel like. Is it supposed to be unbearably hot and humid? Is it supposed to rain all the time? It doesn't feel like it's supposed to be cool, not very humid, not raining. It feels a little bit like March, or maybe it feels like March was just yesterday. For as long as March felt like it lasted, it feels like it barely existed. It's like we jumped six months into the future. What's communion supposed to feel like? Not the physical bread or the juice, but our emotion. What, what are we supposed to feel? If we don't feel that thing, are we messing something up? Did we do something wrong? What are we supposed to feel? What is it supposed to feel like? I think that is the wrong question to ask. I think we just need to sit back and enjoy the remembrance, to experience the recollection of what Christ has done for us instead of analyzing too deeply. If we sit outside and look at the weather and wonder what August is supposed to feel like, we can't quite enjoy the August that God gave us. In this moment, I want to encourage you to put aside whatever you might be feeling or whatever debates or discussions might be going on through your minds and remember what Christ did for each of us on the cross. Lord, I thank you that you are here with us in every way, every day. I thank you that you have provided for us and protected us so much this week. We thank you that this hurricane was not as bad as it could have been down south. We thank you that the coronavirus numbers are going down. We thank you that you are with us at every moment of every day. Lord, help us this week as we seek to focus on you. We seek to honor you. We seek to do your will. And Lord, I pray that we would take time to give you praise, to give you honor and glory and worship and Lord, we ask that you would help us as we continue this service with worship, that we would have the same kind of passion 
in our minds and in our hearts and on our lips as David did when he sang and danced before the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.